He is risen. Yes, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Hey, welcome to Faith Baptist, everyone. And if you're listening to us on our live stream, we want to welcome you to our morning worship service. Wow, we are coming to the end of August. It is hard to believe how fast the summer has gone, but this morning, it is going to be um, actually our baptism Sunday. So at the end of our service, you will hear testimony from four people that would love to be baptized by immersion today. And you know from last week's message what the, the, how the importance of that is. Just the whole issue of being immersed under, literally saying goodbye to the old life, rising in the newness of life. And this is what Jesus has commanded of his believers. And so it's going to be an exciting day. So after the morning service, we will go over to Ralph and Carla Borchard's home, have a picnic lunch, and then we'll have a, a short service by the lake. We'll sing, I'll have my accordion there, and we'll um, have a time of worship and praise. And then we will watch four people um, go into the water and it's going to be very, and come out again. And it's going to be very exciting. <laughs> that would be really exciting, but um, we, will, we will take them out again. But I want to welcome you, and, and what a great day to worship and praise. We have a lot of families gone, so you'll see me up here a lot because a lot of people texted and said, oh, we're not going to be here or whatever. So um, we're going to have a great time of worship and praise. We'll be in First Peter chapter 4, some uh, great, great truth that God has for us today in his word. But I do want to welcome you here. Um, for this very special day of worship and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to begin singing with the song, Holy, Mighty, Worthy. This is a new hymn that was written by Chris Anderson. Holy, 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 mighty, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy. What a great God we have. So let's sing together, Holy, Mighty, Worthy. Our topic is about 
something interesting that we might not always think about, but why does God hate sin? What is so bad about sin? Why do, why do we need to change our lifestyles? And what is wrong with where we're going now? And I, I think that um, God has presented us with the Bible, and it's a great way to see all these things. So if you, many of you have grown up in a church, and you understand all the stories, and how Noah and the flood, and then it went from Moses, and you, you understand the whole timeline, but you never understand how God was battling sin that entire time. The stories, the failures, the, the problems that happened were all because of sin. So my question is, why does God hate sin? And I think the answer is, God hates sin because he loves us. God hates sin because it is destructive, it is divisive, it has never, um, ever helped anybody find a sense of rest or peace or a sense of belonging. Sin only can bring you down. It can only um, suck you into it more. It, it offers a pleasure that is temporary and indefinite. You will never be able to define it. And once you have obtained it, you understand. Well, you don't understand. You crave more because you're still left empty. That is why God hates sin. He hates sin because he loves you and he cares about how you feel and um, your relationships in this world. And he wants you to have a relationship with him. So if you haven't yet um, believed in Jesus Christ that he is 100% man and 100% God as it talks about the wood overlaid with gold, he came to this earth and he died. He died for your sins after he lived a perfect life. He, out of all people, did not deserve to die. He was tortured, beaten, and destroyed for you so that you may live a life that is glorifying to the Father God. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. I pray that um, you allow us to glorify him today through the service. I pray that anyone here that might not be saved, um, they hear this and that they understand that their need for Jesus, and not that it is a religious uh, thing of works, but a relationship with you that brings completement, completion, fulfillment, and joy into our lives, Lord. And give us, give us wisdom and mercy in helping those and discipling those who need it most. And we pray for the baptism service after um, today, Lord, that we would do it in a way that's honoring and glorifying to you and that we would truly understand what it means to be baptized and what it pictures about Christ dying and rising again, Lord. And Allow that message not to sit lightly on our hearts that Christ died and rose again, that we would be um, exuberated to just share the gospel with those who need it, Lord. Um, and we pray that we refresh ourselves every day with the gospel and who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, Matt. So for announcements today. I just wanted to let you know, remind you that yesterday we did have the memorial service for Lowell Nelson. He passed away on May 7th and we had his service yesterday down at Doherty's funeral home and had an opportunity to reflect on what a good and gracious and really a great savior we have. Because of Lowell's faith in Jesus Christ, right now he's experiencing the glory and the joys of heaven. Even though the um, separation is temporary, we're, coming, we're looking forward to a day of great reunion with every believer in the, in the presence of Jesus. So that was yesterday. So pray for uh, Joanne as she moves out of her house into another apartment now, a different apartment, and all the details that go with that. And then just getting on with life without her husband right now, waiting for the rapture and the glorious return of Jesus. So let, we'll pray for Joanne in just a minute. And then, um, just so you know, her pa she has a pastor down in um, South Padre Island in Texas. She, her and Lowell would go down every winter and spend the, some winter months down there. And over the last, what, 12 or 15 years, they made uh, very good friends with Pastor Bill Waddell and his wife Valerie. So they flew up here for the memorial service for Lowell yesterday. And he is going to be um, preaching this Wednesday at our church. So this Wednesday, Pastor Bill Waddell will be preaching, and he will be, um, I believe, talking about the genealogy in Matthew 1. And there's just a really special pattern and, and kind of understanding of Matthew 1. He is really an Old Testament guy. He wrote a book and published a book on Christ in the Old Testament. So you'll really enjoy Pastor Bill Waddell 
on Wednesday night for our, our service. We'll have the teens up here as well. So the teens and all the, all the, everybody will be up here for Wednesday at 6.30. And then what else? Melissa, anything else? Yes. Jenny has an announcement to share since I don't know all of the details. Thanks, Jenny. Hi. So Mom's Bible Study is starting a new book called Beautiful in God's Eyes. And I don't have it right in front of me, but it's something about discovering the treasures of the Proverbs 31 woman. So if anybody's interested, it, well, any moms, <laughs> it is usually Wednesday mornings at about 1030, and it's usually lately on Zoom. So just talk to me sometime if you're interested. Thanks. All right, great to have a mom's Bible study as well. That's, that's very special. Hey, I see Spencer Smith out there. Spencer, how are you doing? Spencer is a Marine. He signed up for the Marines, so um, praise the Lord for Spencer. We're really just really pleased with this young man and the direction that God is bringing him. And so um, praise the Lord. Uh, you'll, make a, you'll make an excellent Marine. So let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll pray for Joanne, and we'll just pray for our church family. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be together today be able to encourage one another, strengthen one another, and come alongside. And so we think of Joanne, and we pray that you will comfort her during this time of temporary separation with her husband. We're so grateful that Lowell, with faith in Jesus Christ, is in your presence right now. He's in heaven, enjoying life without sin and, and all the things that go with that. But um, we do pray for Joanne. Give her comfort and strength for each day as she walks on this earth. We're thankful for Spencer, too, and just the work you're doing in his life, and even for signing up uh, to be a Marine. We just pray that you'll bless his future and just guard his every step. We're so grateful for this young man, and again, we ask your blessing and guidance and protection on him. On him. And again, we're thankful for all the different ministries, the baptism service, the mom's Bible study, uh, so many great things that you're doing in our lives. So thank you, Father, so much for our local church and for all of our missionaries that are serving worldwide. Protect them, give them um, guidance, and provide the resources necessary for them to reach the gospel with whatever people groups that you have set them in. And we, Father, seek to do the same here in Hermantown. May you be glorified in and through our church. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to sing our next song, and the next song is His Robes for Mine. Talking about the great exchange. My sin laid upon Jesus, and then when I trusted him, his righteousness came upon myself. Wow, isn't that, isn't, isn't that a great exchange? So let's sing His Robes for Mine.
Scripture reading today will be in 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. Let's begin. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, and the next song we'll be singing is Jesus is Mine. And what a great privilege for us who are in Christ that we can say that. Jesus is mine.
Praise the Lord. Isn't that a great song? I know we sing, we've been singing that one quite a bit over the summer, but I love it. Jesus is ours by faith. And with him comes everything. Doesn't Romans 8 say not only did Jesus, God the Father give us Jesus, but he gave us also all things freely as well. So praise the Lord for the grace and the mercy of our great God and Savior. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll have a word of prayer. Thank you, Jared, for reading the scriptures. I love the reading of scripture, and uh, that is the most important thing, is to hear the word of God and then to, to keep it. We are in the book of 1 Peter, and we're thinking of Peter, this fisherman, now believer in Jesus, a preacher of the gospel, and he is, he is writing to those believers who are literally now pilgrims and strangers. They've been uprooted from their homes and businesses and comfort zone, and they've been brought up to this region of Asia Minor, and there they are being um, persecuted, reviled against, spoken against. And so Peter has spent a lot of time in the opening chapters talking about our position in Christ. All that has come through our new birth. We have this, this inheritance which will not fade away, which is sin-proof, decay-proof, and time-proof. We have necessary profitable trials that we could come forth pure as gold, and on and on. We need to have a girded mind, a reverent mind, a pure mind, and a loving mind. And then he goes on and talks about us as a spiritual priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices. We're the new chosen people, the royal priesthood. So many great blessings. Then he talks about our, our relationship to the world. We are to be known as men and women who are submissive. We want our, on, our conduct to be honorable so that the unsaved world around us will see Christ. Not only they will, will they hear it from our lips, but they'll see it in our behavior and our attitude. So there's submission towards the government. There's to, submission, slaves to masters, or we would even say submission in the workplace. There's submission in the home, wives to husbands, and even in 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands um, in a submissive tone to their wives, honoring and treating their wives as treasures, lest their prayers be hindered. And then uh, we talked about, uh, in chapter 4, the suffering of Jesus. And now here we are in verse 7. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. We do pray that the Holy Spirit will open our mind and give us understanding that he would be the teacher this morning of, of the truth of this text. That he would also give us the power and the ability to obey what this text says for the church. And we do pray, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. We anticipate the end, and we want to know how to live in a way that will please you in these last days, as well as reach the last around us. So we're grateful for the word of God, for the Holy Spirit, and I do pray that we would receive it this morning, that it would fall on good ground and bear much fruit for the glory of Jesus. Amen. So Peter says in chapter 4, verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So the end of all things, literally all things is the way the Greek begins. All things, the end is coming. No, can you imagine? Listen, imagine if you received a phone call today and it was your doctor. You had a doctor's visit this week and now the doctor calls you and says, listen, you have 24 hours to live. That is it. In 24 hours, by tomorrow morning, you will be dead. You will die. How would that impact your life? How would that change your life? Seriously, to know that you only have a short time left, like literally hours. What would you do different? Well, hey, maybe you would grab your family and say, oh man, we got to go and have the biggest party and eat the most food and have the most calories and we're just going to enjoy whatever last 20 minute, 24 hours we have left. Or maybe, hey, I've never been able to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope wire with a wheelbarrow. I'm going to go ahead and give it a chance. Or, or maybe I want to go to Royal Gorge Bridge in Colorado and just bungee jump because I've never, I've always been afraid to die and since I'm going to die anyways, I might as well jump off and bungee and see what it feels like. I mean, what would we do with those last 24 hours? If we're thinking spiritually, we might, we might think that God wants us to look up in the sky anticipating his return, doing nothing. Although the disciples tried that, remember in the book of Acts, chapter 1, after Jesus ascended to heaven on, on the Mount of Olives, they're still looking up at Jesus, waiting for his return, and the angel said, stop looking up there. The same Jesus will return in like manner, but go into Jerusalem. And, and what do they do? They go and they pray. 
So that's not what we should be doing is staring up at the sky for the next 24 hours. Um, we might think, we, we might think, like Noah. Noah was given advanced warning that the world was going to end as he knew it. There was going to be this worldwide catastrophe catastrophic flood. And so what does God have Noah do but something extraordinary, something gigantic, build a boat in the desert and prepare it for all the animal kingdom and for whoever of humanity will believe. And so for 120 years, knowing the end is near, Noah does this incredible work of building this mammoth sea vessel. I mean, is that what God is asking the church to do as we anticipate that the end of all things is near. And by the way, is, is it truly the end of all things near? Really? Listen, when Peter wrote this, it was 2,000 years ago. We've been waiting 2,000 years for the end. Is, do we really believe the end is coming? Wait a minute. Could it be near mathematically? What's 2,000 years out of 2,000 years? The number one, 2,000 out of 2,000. What's 2,000 years out of 4,000 years? One half. So now it's getting a little bit lower. What's 2,000 years out of 6,000 years? One third. So now we're getting closer to zero. What's 2,000 years compared to all eternity? That's, that's longer than 2,000 years out of all eternity, right? Oh, 2,000 years is nothing for an eternal God. And I can tell you this, the end, literally, the end of all things is at hand. It is near. Literally, it is right around the corner. So what are we to do? So Martin Luther, it was asked of Martin Luther one day, Martin, if this was your last day on earth, what would you do with your time? And do you know what Martin Luther said, this great theologian of the Protestant Reformation? He said, without hesitation, I will do two things. You ready for him? Plant a tree and pay taxes. Because that was what was on his agenda that day. Literally, I'm not going to change anything because I'm going to do the appointed task for the day as I wait for the Lord's return. I'm going to live every day like it's the last day on earth. So what Peter's going to do here is he's going to tell us God is not asking for us to do something extraordinary. And he's not asking us to do nothing but just wait around. He wants us to do in this text three things. He wants us to pray seriously. He wants us to love fervently. And he wants us to serve passionately. And we're going to take a look at each one. So let's begin. He wants us to pray seriously. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, as a response to this, be serious and watchful in your prayers. We need to pray seriously. Now maybe Peter, think with me. Come on, think like Peter. As he's writing this, maybe on vellum or on some papyrus, papyri, and as he's writing it or his secretary is writing it, what do you think Peter's thinking when he says, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers? Could he not be thinking about the Garden of Gethsemane? Not that many years prior, when he was just a young man following the Lord, and they had come out of the upper room where the Last Supper was held. They made their way in those dark, cold streets of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley, came into the Garden of Gethsemane, Eight disciples off the road by the entrance to the garden. Peter, James, and John moved into the garden with Jesus. And then Jesus went a stone's throw away. And there Jesus told those three disciples, watch and what? Watch and pray. You don't know what's going to happen in the next few hours, but you need to watch and you need to be praying. And then Jesus goes off to pray for an hour. And then he comes back. And what are they doing? Sleeping because their eyes are heavy. So he wakes them up and he talks to Peter. Peter, did I not tell you watch and pray? Watch and pray. And then he goes off and he prays again for another hour. And then he comes back saying the same words. And Matthew 26 gives us the one hour time frame. He comes back not only a second time, he comes back a third time and he wakes up Peter and he says, did I not tell you to watch and pray? Look, for the time is at hand. For the, you know, he knows the Son of Man will be arrested and then so, shortly after crucified. Don't you think that Peter is thinking, oh, I should have been so much, I should, be, I should have been alert. But you know that heavy Passover dinner, you know, and the cool night air, and it's been a busy day, and it's been a long week, and the, and the, the triumphal entry and everything. And, and so now he's pleading with the believers. You want, you want something to be doing while you're waiting for Jesus to return, to take the church to be with him? 
then be serious about your prayers. And when I talk about prayer, doesn't it make you a little uncomfortable? Maybe it makes you a little nervous. Why? Because really, we just don't do it. We're just not serious prayer people, typically, and we're not that alert or watchful in our prayers, typically. Barna says that the average time that a Christian spends in prayer is one minute a day. One minute a day, the average Christian, which basically would cover a meal, a quick meal, a happy meal. Um, The average pastor, the average pastor in America, according to the same poll, prays five minutes a day. Wow. The hard thing about prayer is that it's difficult. It's difficult to pray to a God you cannot see to get an answer that maybe doesn't come right away. There's no immediate effect. So it's a big matter of faith to be able to pray and to pray with alertness and to pray for watchfulness. Now, I'm not saying this to heap guilt upon you or to shame you either by any means. When I'm talking about prayer, I'm talking about my own life. I'm, I'm talking about how challenging it is. Do you know the problem with this whole idea He says here in verse 7, therefore, be serious and watchful. Two Greek words, be serious, be watchful. Literally both mean like clear-minded, be self-controlled, be without intoxication. Be be without the influence of other things. Literally to to be alert, to be thinking, to be clear. When we go to prayer, the first thing that happens is what? We begin to think about, oh, what am I going to eat later? Oh, I forgot to pick this up at the store. Oh, well, what about this? I mean, it is so hard because our mind gets so distracted. And we are so busy with our minds full of things that it is hard to spend any concentrated amount of time in prayer. This whole idea of being serious and being watchful could mean that we have lost this this spiritual alertness that we once had with Jesus. And do you know what happens over time with any relationship? There begins to be a loss of passion, even in a marriage, unless you're intentional about keeping it up. So when I was first saved, somewhat 26, 27 years ago, when I first understood who Jesus Christ is, that he's the creator of everything, he just simply created everything by his spoken word, out of no pre-existing material. And then, then when I knew that he took upon himself human flesh, And that Jesus died on the cross, and on the cross he paid my my sin in his own body. And then he rose from the dead. And then I thought, oh man, I want to talk to him all the time. And man, I I prayed all the time. Our youth group prayed all the time. It was was absolutely phenomenal. But then do you know what happens over time, even with our relationship with Jesus? We sometimes lose that passion. You remember the the church in, in Ephesus in Revelation 2? What was Jesus' word of condemnation against the church in Ephesus? They did lots of great things. They kept away the false teachers. They had many good works. They, they were sending many people out with the gospel. But the one thing Jesus had against them was they left their first love. They didn't, they didn't lose it. They left it. It was a deliberate thing. It, just, it happened over time. Now, when Melissa and I, you know, remember when we were first dating, back when phones were still attached to the, the, the wall. And, and like, we would be on the phone, and Melissa and I would talk for hours. She lived down in Morgan Park, I lived up in Piedmont, and we would talk for hours. And I, honestly, I don't even know what we talked about, but we talked about everything. We talked about ice cubes. Oh, the ice cube I'm drinking right now. Oh, it's so cold. Oh, Melissa's like, oh yeah, I love ice cubes. And then, oh, but you know, look at my, car- my carpet looks like this. It's, it's green with swirls. And I mean, we talked about everything. We talked about, I mean, just talk, 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 talk. And then we were dating and we went down to uh, Perkins restaurant on 40th. Remember this? We were, and we were like, chat, 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 chat. We, we could hardly eat. We were talking to each other so much. And then we saw an older couple across from us sitting there, not saying a word. We're like, they've been married a long time. We're never going to get like that. You know, I don't think that couple, remember that couple? They didn't say one word to each other the entire time. And we were just like, we couldn't, talk, we couldn't stop enough. But you know what happens if you're not intentional with, with that communication? you begin to lose the passion. You begin to no longer talk about anything. And pretty soon you're reduced to talking about, did you let the dogs out? Good. Did you let the dogs out? Did you feed the dogs? I mean, you could get down to your whole married life 
talking to each other over just the most superficial, simple things. But that happens in our, in our walk with Jesus as well. Do, no, do you remember Jesus? In Mark 2, Jesus gets up before the sun rose to go to pray. Man, I bet he was tired the night before. And early before the sun is even up, he gets up off of his cot and he just heads out to talk to the Father. In Luke chapter 5, he spent a whole night on the mountain in prayer. Like he missed a night's sleep. He just, but he, I bet for Jesus, he's like, I just can't get enough of the Father. I need my Father. I want that relationship. I want to communicate. I want to talk. And he's just setting a great example for us. What does Daniel do in chapter 6 when Daniel is some 85, 86-year-old man being ready to t- be tossed in the lion's den? When does he pray? Three times, morning, noon, and night, as he had done all of his life. He just set aside those times saying, I need time with my, with my God. I'm, I'm going to be talking to him. Um, what about David in, in Psalm 5? Early in the morning will my voice rise up to you while I look up to you. In Psalm 55, verse 17, David says, Morning, noon, and night I will call upon your great name. Wouldn't that be great if God heard from his children at least three times a day? Wouldn't that be neat? Where God the Father would say, my children want me. My children love me. But even as the days of Christ is approaching, we need to be even more serious and even more alert and clear-minded about prayer. Whether it's formal times of prayer or informal, where we're just simply talking to the Lord all day long. My students at school, when we were meeting face-to-face, they would interrupt my lesson about anything biblical just to keep me from teaching math. But they would shout out in the middle of a math a two-step algebraic equation, and I don't know, Spencer, you might remember some of these days too, would they be like, well, Mr. Wita, do you pray? What's that all about? And I'm like, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm praying right now in this class. Well, you can't pray in school. I said, I'm not saying it out loud, but I'm talking to God even during the math lesson. I'm praying for the student that I know is going through a hard time or I can just see in their face just nothing but despair. And we can pray like that all day. Just you're talking to the Father. Like Melissa and I, honestly, we talk to each other all day. Praise God for cell phones for that very reason. Like even if it's just, hey, what you doing? How you doing? It's just a quick word. It doesn't have to be an hour long, but just to find out, hey, I'm here. Where are you? I, I miss you even though I saw her this morning. You know, that type of thing. Is, don't, don't we want to cultivate that when we're serious and watchful in prayers? What do you want to do with the remaining time that we have until Jesus comes? Let's pray seriously. Let's pray, pray seriously. Look at the next one, verse 8. And above all things, preeminently holding first place, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. The second thing, what, we, what are we to do? We are to love fervently. Love fervently. Now, you know what the trademark or the identification for Abraham was? If you were a child of Abraham and you were a man or boy, your trademark would be circumcision. If you were a follower of the Mosaic law, do you know how you were identified? You kept the Sabbath. You you didn't work on the Sabbath. If you were a follower of John the Baptist, you would be identified with John's baptism in the Jordan River. Jesus said in John 13, you want to be known as my disciple? You want an identification marker that you truly are my child? By faith, you are my disciple? The world must see that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's required. What do we do in these last days when literally I could die before noon? Love one another fervently. I love the Greek word fervently. The word fervently, above all things, love fervently. It's the word epektinos. It means to literally to stretch out, to stretch out your hand or to stretch out your body. It is the word used for a horse at full gallop. Now, when I was living in Israel, on, uh, I would go visit Kibbutz de Ganya Aleph on Saturdays and I would do horseback riding on Kibbutz de Ganya Aleph along the Jordan River. And once in a while, my horse would get away. And I, I, I don't know how to control a horse. I would just kick it and, hope, and then sometimes I kicked it too hard or something. But, but literally, um, I never went at a full, full gallop. But you know what a full gallop for a horse is? When every muscle 
and all of their being is, is going forward, right? They're literally stretching every leg muscle, every heart muscle. They're breathing. Their lungs are at full capacity, and they're just galloping, galloping, galloping. This same word is used not only for a horse galloping at full strength, but also for an athlete that's running a race, and they are they're coming along the, to the finish line, and they want to win first. Now, if you want to win first, and you're a, a, a runner, what are you going to do with your arms? To get across that finish line, you're going to try to stretch forward as much as you can, right? You're going to use every ounce of energy, every muscle, all your strength. You're going to give it your all to get across that finish line first. That is the word fervently. It means to hold nothing back, to give it your all. Now, do we love like that? I mean, do we love where we literally give it our all? We have nothing left. We are totally spent of ourselves because we just love that fervently. How serious are, are we with our prayers? I don't know. But let's, let's think about this. Love fervently. The, there's two aspects to love. The first love is this. Uh, have fervent love for one another. For, and then he quotes Proverbs 10, verse 12. Love fervently, for love will cover a multitude of sins. There's a covering aspect to love. Proverbs 10, 12 says this. Hatred stirs up strife, stirs up dissension, but love covers a multitude of sins. This covering love, well, think of this. Somebody offends you in the church, because this is fervently love one another. Somebody offends you in the church, and then you find out some dirt on them. You find out some really good, nasty stuff. You have a choice of covering it, or you have a choice of exposing it, right? It doesn't matter if it's somebody that's wronged you or not, just anybody. You find out any bit of dirt on somebody, you can easily broadcast it and expose that to a whole group of people, or with love, you can cover it. Now listen, covering sin does not mean tolerating it. It doesn't mean that, hey, it's no big deal, go ahead and sin all you want, we're just not going to look that way. Not at all. Matthew 18 says that if we find somebody who has offended us or sinned against us, we go to them one-on-one. -on -one. If they are still not repentant, we take somebody else with us. That's two-on-one -on -one as witnesses. And if they still don't repent, then we go church. We bring, the church. we bring it before the church. And if they still have not repented for their sin, it's become public with that church step, right? Then everybody knows and it's been exposed. So sometimes sin has to be exposed, but the idea is, I'm not going to go around and air everybody else's dirty laundry. I'm not going to go around and expose their sin and humiliate them and attack them. I would rather seek to handle things privately until it gets to the point where there's no choice, but it's got to be brought to the public. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a whole different attitude. If, you, if love is to cover a multitude of sins, you're not going to quickly broad, broadcast because you want to get somebody and level them pretty bad. Man, I just can't wait until they're put in their place, so let me tell you what they did. And then you can tell five people what they did, and, and on and on and on. Do you, do you see the problem? Do you want to know the big issue with gossip? Gossip is not loving. There's, there's no love in gossip. It's simply, oh, I've got to expose their sins so everybody can find out what really nasty people they are, and then, man, I'm going to look pretty good myself. Some people do take pride in uncovering sin. They almost feel like they're the sin police, and they would broadcast any little bit of information that they can find that they would have against anybody. Do you know what that does? That kind of broadcasting of sin um, stirs up dissension. It stirs up strife. And again, I'm not saying that there's never a time and a place. There's unrepentance. There's willful disobedience. And if it's not dealt with, that needs to come before the church. But if somebody is dealing with their sin and working on it, then protect, right? Protect. A lot of people have been angry and hurt over things not being dealt, right, dealt, dealt properly. But not only is there a covering love that we're to be stretched out and fervent and to give our all to, but there's a hospitable love. There's a refreshing love. Look at verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. This Greek word, hospitable, it means a lover of strangers. Just to take in 
strangers and care for them. It's where we get the idea of hospital, hospitality. It means to care for those who are strangers, to set them up in beds and take care of their wounds and all sorts of things. We, we are to be loving fervently in the area of hospitality. Do you know why that's difficult? Because sometimes people drive you nuts. And you bring them into your house, and they drive you more nuts. And, and then there's time, and there's energy, and there's resources, and then there's dirt. Tracking in, messing up, and it's like, wait a minute. We are commanded to love the strangers. Now, in the context, I think, in the early church, you would have traveling ministers, traveling preachers. And, and they did not have inns like we have. We, they didn't have the American. They didn't have the Fairfield. They didn't have the country inn and suites. They didn't have holiday inns. The inns were dangerous. They were despicable. There were no hot tubs and pools available and continental breakfast or get your waffle with strawberry sauce and a big thing of whipped cream. No, the inns in those days were dangerous. You'd be crazy to be sleeping there. So what a traveling preacher would do is come into an area, find out where the believers are, knock on their door and say, hey, we're passing through town. It's late in the night. Could you give us some, a room to sleep in and maybe some food for our belly? And you are then to go all the way and provide for them. And I've seen this when on my traveling around, like when I was in Pakistan, honestly, the hospitality I was given, it was par none. It was amazing. It, really, the, I would go into places that, where they had absolute poverty. I know one family, I think they had five chickens. And after I finished preaching, um, Pastor Shokat said, uh, Pastor Brian, this family wants to have you for lunch. Not me physically, but have me over for lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and he said, and they want to give you one of their chickens. They only have five for the whole family. And uh, then they said, you get to pick your own chicken. And I'm like, so I'm going in a, in a little fenced-in area, trying me, a city boy, trying to catch a chicken with my own hands. And, and then I couldn't, so the young lad did. He just grabbed one without any problem. And then he hands it to me, and I got this thing kicking in my arms. And then, they're, then they give me a knife, and they're like, well, now they, it's the honor for you to kill it. And I'm like, ah, blood. You don't know me in blood. And, you know, can you see me killing a chicken and defeathering? And oh, man, crazy. But I'll tell you what. This family had nothing, and then they gave me the, the like, they treated me like the most important person in Pakistan. I was down in Peru with the Quechua Indians, working with some of our missionaries, and I was invited into one of the Peruvians' homes, and literally dirt floor, fire in the middle, and um, I was going to sit on a little milk stool, and the man was like yelling at me. He's like, uh -uh, like this, and I was like, I, maybe that was his stool. I wasn't sure, and he went and he he um, took his jacket off and he walked across the the dirt floor there and he ro rolled up his jacket and he put it down so I could sit on his jacket instead of the milk stool and I was like humbled that they would care for me like that right that's fervent stretched out love that's the kind of love we need for others even in the early church where would they meet for worship in people's houses so it's one thing to have two, three, or five, or eight people. What about having 50 people in your house, giving them food and having them trek their muddy boots in your house and then having to clean up after them? And then you do it again the next day when they meet, and then the next day when they meet, and then the next day when they meet. That's why we are to show hospitality without grumbling. Literally, gongamus is the word. It sounds like what it means, gongamus. You know, like a gong? If you hit a big gong, even gently... It just barely vibrates. It just creates an undercurrent of noise in your ear. That's what grumbling is. It's just a little bit of just whispering under the breath. Oh, man, do we really have to take care of these people? I mean, honestly, we've been tested in many areas. I've been tested in prayer, love, and hospitality this week. Thank you for confessing my sins to others. But, um, but I, I even had to tell Melissa. I'm like, okay, Melissa, you know, I'm preaching about not grumbling. I'm not going to grumble. I don't want to have a bad attitude. I want to be fervently stretched out in love. God is funny how he works even, even in, in this area. But um, think with me as we close this whole thought of love. Listen carefully. COVID-19, this pandemic, is a big deal, right? I mean, there's a lot of people that have it and whatever's going on in this world with this, with this pandemic. Um, I would say that the greatest disease or the greatest issue with humanity is not COVID-19. It is not heart disease. It is not alcoholism. It is not drug use. 
I think the greatest disease that humanity has is lovelessness, is not fervently loving others. Can you imagine if all sides of the aisle politically truly loved each other fervently with a stretched out love? Can you imagine that? I, can you imagine them getting along with fervent love, seeking to serve the other side of the aisle rather than themselves or whatever? It, how, like, can you imagine the looting and rioting even going on in Portland? If all of a sudden those people thought, I need to love one another fervently with a stretched out love. And they're like, hey, I'm not going to bash in this, wi- this sh- window of a shop and steal their goods. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them. I'm going to sweep up and I'm going to clean and I'm going to serve them. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing? Just be great. Instead of disrespecting our law enforcement, caring for them and helping them. And man, it would just, well, it would be the millennial kingdom is what it would be here on this earth. So what about love, real quick? Do you have the ability to love fervently? Take your Bibles. Go with me to Romans chapter 5, quickly. Romans chapter 5. Just in case you think, yeah, but I can never love that way. I mean, honestly, I've thought that way lately. Look at Romans 5. Verse 3, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character produces hope. And this hope, this confidence in the Lord, does not disappoint. Verse 5, Romans 5, 5, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If you have the Holy Spirit, according to this text, you have the love of God poured out of your heart. Now, how, how deep is the love of God? How deep? Everlasting, endless, infinite. He has, listen, he has an infinite reservoir of love. And he is pouring that love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I have more than enough love to love my wife the way I need to love her. She has more than enough love from God to love me the way that God wants her to. I have more than enough love to fervently love this church to be stretched out, to open our house, to open our lives, to open our resources, to give and give and give and give. I have more than enough love. Do you not, do you not agree? Parents, you have more than enough love to pour into your children, and you have buckets and buckets left over. I really like how Matt, the, the other day when he was preaching on James 2, and he was preaching about mercy and judgment, how we want lots of mercy from the Lord. We want tanker loads, is what you said, right? We want tanker loads of mercy from God, but we like to dish it out in teaspoons. I would say we have an endless supply of love from God through the Holy Spirit, poured out in our hearts, ready and available for use, but we love to dish it out by half teaspoons. Oh, that person, a quarter teaspoon. I'll give you a cup. You're my wife. You know, me, I want bucket loads just on me because I love me. You know, that type of thing. No, we need to love fervently with a stretched out love. But thirdly, and lastly, we need to serve passionately. Look at the text, 1 Peter chapter 4. We need to serve passionately. Pray seriously, love fervently. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it, serve it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. I'm going to take you quickly through the text. Not long, but quickly. Just follow the phrases. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift. Here it is, everybody. The first thing about spiritually, spiritual gifts and serving passionately, everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, who is born again and has the Spirit of God, everyone has a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts. Everyone. And everyone's gift matters. And we get different proportions of gift. Some people get great grace in gifts, and others have a different measure of grace. And that's okay. I'm not a, a Chuck Swindoll. I'm not a David Jeremiah. I'm not a, I'm not a Pastor Bill Waddell. I, you know, and I tried to be. In my early days of ministry, and Pastor Bill, I don't know if this was ever like for you, but when I was new in ministry, like a brand new Christian, and I was thrown into the pastorate, I was like, oh man, I've got to find my favorite preachers and be just like them. And I tried. I tried to give humor like them. I'm not a funny guy. You know, I'm not. And then there's others that are like the greatest storytellers. And I tried to tell stories early on in my ministry. I look at my notes. I'm like, man, that whole thing was full of stories. I mean, there was Bible in there, but man, there was tons of stories. And I was like, 
man, the stories were all over the place. How did anybody listen to me? And, and, you know, and I don't even know if I like who I am right now, but, but you get what you get, right? So we all have different measures of grace, but listen, everybody who is born again has a spiritual gift. Peter says, as each one has received a gift, minister it. We need to serve one another. The word minister, diakonos, means to cut through the dust. It was the idea of somebody in a restaurant in the early days with dirt floors. You would serve another table, bring them their glass of water, bring them their chicken, you know, intact with the guts and all. You know, whole, just you'd run, run across the dust and you would kick up a trail of dust. You were so intent on serving. That's the idea. Serve passionately. Minister it. So what's the purpose of our gift? For one another. My, my gift, my spiritual gifts are not to build me up. There to build the church up. To, so it says, minister it to one another. So everyone has spiritual gifts. We all have different measures of gifts. And we're to use it to build one another up, not ourselves. Then he goes on and he says, as good stewards. What does a steward own? Nothing that they're taking care of. They're stewards. They're, they're, they're entrusted with something. God has entrusted me with the gift of pastoring and, and teaching the word of God, which means when I get to heaven, I'm going to be held in no account for that. So if you're a steward, we need to be a good steward of what God has given us. We need to actually be serving and using our gifts. Then he says this, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter uses the word manifold. It means multicolored. I think the grace of God is amazing. The grace of God hits a Steve Morgan, and out comes the color blue. The same grace of God hits through Judy and her gifts, and she comes out with a green or a red. I mean, we're all multicolored. We're all part of God's whole spectrum for the health and glory of God, for the brightness and the light of God. We're all various shades of color. It's just multifaceted, multivaried color of gifts. And that's what makes the body of Christ beautiful. You know how Paul talks about the spiritual gifts? Not like multicolored, but he talks about the body of, of a human. I have many different functions. I have hands that do things. My feet do things. My hands do things my mouth can't do. Well, some things my mouth can do, I guess. But you see what I'm saying? All of my parts of my body have different functions, but it's one body. So we're all many functioned, variety, diverse people for the one body that we're serving, the body of Christ. So we're good stewards in the manifold grace of God. Listen, there's two, I think, two general categories of gifts, speaking gifts and serving gifts. If anyone speaks, then speak the oracles of God. You are messengers of divine truth. You're teaching a Sunday school class. You are teaching the word of God. You are teaching divine truth. This is just a great responsibility. So if you're preaching, it's not your own thoughts, your own motivations. It is what is the intent of this text according to God, and let me deliver it that way. So if you speak, speak as the oracles of God. If you minister, if you have a serving gift, and then you have to do it with the ability, the power which with God supplies. You're not doing it in your own flesh for your glory, but you're doing it in the power of the Spirit for his glory. So there's different gifts. I'll tell you them real quick. For speaking gifts, there's the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, and the exhorter. And each one's necessary in the Bible. The evangelist makes new babies. The pastor shepherds and guides and feeds and directs them, cares for them. The teacher gives them systematic teaching so they have a good base of understanding and truth. And then the exhorter comes alongside and says, now go and do it. This is the truth, now do it. If any one of those four gifts is missing, you don't have new babies, you don't have leadership as a shepherd in the church, if you don't have a teacher, you don't have truth, and if you don't have an exhorter, nobody's obeying it, then the whole thing falls apart. There's four spe uh, serving gifts, leadership, mercy, giving, and helps. All of those are important. The administrator has a vision, taking a ship from one point to another point, knows where the church is going to go in a few years. The one with mercy looks around and sees all the needs. Oh, they're hurting, they're hurting, they need food, they need comfort, they need a blanket. They see the needs. The one that helps, the helper, is the one who actually goes and gets the blanket, makes the food and brings it. And then the giver is the one that gives the finances and the resources to make the meal and have the blanket and stuff. If any one of those is missing, the church is incomplete and no good. So we need everybody's gift. Basically, I'm telling you, your gift is, is important and needed in the church. I am not the most important in the church. I have a function and a gift, but so do you. And let's 
One last thing. The ultimate end of the gifts is this, verse 11, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate goal. So let me end with this. If you are not if you are not serious about your prayers, fervent in your love, and serving passionately, then God is not getting the glory he deserves. That in all things, God may be glorified. If you're not active in a local church, if you're not plugged in and using your serving or speaking gifts, then God is not getting the glory that he is worthy of. So we want to give him even more glory with the operation of these three things. And then it says, to whom, Jesus Christ, through whom belong the glory, Jesus gets all the glory, and he has the dominion, the authority over all things forever and ever. Amen. What a great doxology. So how are you doing? Are you serious in your prayers? Are you fervent in your love? And are you passionate in your service? This is what we're to do. If we only have 24 hours left, be doing these things. And um, who knows when the end will draw near who knows? Could be very, very soon. But let's commit to applying these in our life and watching it transform our relationships. Most of all, our relationship and our closeness and intimacy with the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus. You've heard the gospel and you understand it's not through works or religion. It's through faith alone in Jesus Christ. He died in your place for your sins. It's not your good works. It's not religion. But it is trusting him alone that you're born into his family, and then you can do these things. Without that, without Jesus Christ, without faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you will perish. That's just it. You will perish. And um, what a difficult thing to even think of. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this morning and for the opportunity to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. And even as the end of all things draws near, it's right around the corner. It is even closer around the corner than in Peter's day. So we need to be serious in our prayers. Help us this week to just develop intimacy with you through just talking to you, calling out to you, praying, speaking to you. Help us not just to be one minute or five minute a day people, but help us to commune and to speak to you throughout the day. Even if we need to start by just setting aside certain times of the day to spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just to be alone with you. Free us from the distractions and the busy busyness of the week. And I pray, Father, for our, our love to be fervent, to be stretched out, whether we're protecting and helping others or whether we're um, refreshing those who come our way. And then help us to take seriously the spiritual gifts that you've given us, to use them to build up our local church so that you might be made glorious, even more so, even that you might, your glory might be made known to our community because they see all the gifts operating in this church. Oh, to Jesus alone be the dominion and the power and the glory forever and forever. And all God's people said, amen. All right, well, praise God.